That's a good turnout, huh? All right. Well, welcome to the last colloquium of this quarter. And uh, looks like we're going to end with a bang. It's certainly an honor and a, and a pleasure to um, introduce a friend of mine, uh, Tom Lee, who is a professor at Stanford University and has had a, a pretty colorful career. Um, he did his um, bachelor's, master's, and PhD at MIT. Then he spent some time at analog devices designing PLLs. And, and for those of you that read that kind of literature, you'll see a lot of papers from the late 80s, early 90s from, from Tom related to oscillators and timing in, in CMOS, um, which is an area that he specialized in. And then he went to, he was an early employee at Rambus when it was just a little company. And after that, he went to Stanford University, at, I think in 1994. Um, he's written many textbooks and many uh, publications, particularly in the area of uh, highly integrated CMOS mixed signal uh, circuits. And he also has a, a well-known uh, textbook. I can't actually remember the exact title, but it's related to <laughs> CMOS RF. I use it in my class. So those of you that have taken 536, it's the book that we use, the textbook. Um, and um, he uh, recently, he's, he's founded uh, a couple of companies. One is Matrix Semiconductor, and the other one is Zero G. And then he spent some time at DARPA as the director of MTO. And now he's back at Stanford. And another notable thing, uh, recently he won the Ho-Am uh, Prize in Korea, which is their version of the Nobel uh, pr uh, Prize. So with that said, I'll let uh, Tom take it over. Thank you. So as the title says, this is the unknown history of Silicon Valley. It's unknown even to me. So I'm just making stuff up, and your job is to figure out when I'm BSing you and when I'm telling you the truth. So that's the challenge for you to, to stay awake. So, you know, a couple of quick things. You're all engineers, you all know all this stuff. I just want to point out that you live in an age of miracles, and it's unclear whether or not this is a miracle that can be replicated or sustained. But ingots have grown. This is the state of the art in, in single crystal growth as of around 1959, and this is it today. By the way, as a grad student, I was told that we would never be able to do this. I did a homework problem, which says you can never make this happen. Somewhere along, apparently, there was a mistake made, and I want a refund from MIT. So uh, devices have shrunk at the same time that we've scaled up the ability to grow gigantic crystals. Here's the very first MOSFET. You can actually see all the regions <laughs> almost with a naked eye. It and the Great Wall of China are both visible from outer space. And uh, today, of course, now we're printing transistors with penny 20 nanometers and on down gate lengths. Here you can resolve the actual lattice constant of silicon. That to me is a miracle. It still blows my mind that that's possible to do. ICs have gotten more complex as we've been able to shrink the features. We can put more of them in a given area. Uh, I love showing this to my freshmen because they think that I've made a typo here when I say it's 2,000 transistors, that it's a 256-bit SRAM. They've never seen that. They always see a prefix that's got a G in it. And they say, no, what do you mean? Isn't that a typo? No, no, it's 256 bits. You could actually name each one. There's Bob the transistor here next to Mary the transistor over there. And today, of course, now you can't even resolve functional blocks almost. It's impossible. There's a 7.1 giga transistor GPU over there. So yes, by this time you're saying, I've seen all these slides before. I know all this. Why are you telling this to me? It's to point out, once again, the age of miracles in which you live and to set up how, we, how it is that this all came to be. So yes, I know you're not impressed by any of this because you've been jaded by the regularity of miracles. But there are 10 to the 17th ants on Earth according to Harvard professor Wilson, and I am disinclined to argue with someone who's bothered to figure this out. Now, each year we produce, in aggregate, 100 transistors per ant, and that rate is increasing exponentially. That's a remarkable statistic. So how did this happen, and what the hell did Silicon Valley have to do with it, if anything? So now the standard story that you're likely to get if you just Google for history of Silicon Valley is something that usually starts with some mixture of Fred Terman, provost of, of Stanford, uh, two guys named Hewlett and Packard, and something about some oscillator maybe. And then somehow this guy named Shockley shows up and does something with a transistor and it somehow ends up going from Bell Labs to Silicon Valley. And then Shockley gives rise to Fairchild, which gives rise to Intel, and then suddenly Facebook appears and we're all texting everyone 24-7. So that seems to be the standard narrative, and uh, if this were a movie, this is the time to cue triumphal music. But 
uh, clearly, miracles don't happen quite in a straight line, and we really should look a little bit more skeptically at narratives that purport to give us a linear treatment of history because it's probably made up. So the actual history, as you might suspect, is very nonlinear, it's very rich, it's extremely complex, and involves not a small amount of just plain luck. Uh, the valley has reinvented itself multiple times. There have been many phases of the valley. The Silicon Valley phase is just the latest and perhaps longest lasting one, but it got started well before the First World War. Uh, Silicon arrives only kind of late in, in the movie, if you will. So how does that happen? It starts off in 1903, when 15-year-old boy genius Frank McCarty invents a Spark radio telephone. Up to that point, we only had Spark telegraphy. That's what Marconi gave us, was zip, 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 zart. Yeah, that was it, um, good old Morse code. And by 1905, he's demonstrated a compelling enough prototype that adults are willing to write checks <laughs> to start a company. This is 1905. There he is, featured in an article in the San Francisco uh, I can't, the Clarion Call, yes, uh, September 24th, 1905, and there's a drawing from his patent, and involves a carbon microphone, which has two sections. One is just a plain diaphragm, which basically looks at the zero crossings of the audio waveform, and another one which modulates the resistance of a carbon granule disc. These two signals are fed into the primary of a transformer. Uh, the zero crossing is used to excite a spark train, and then the uh, analog signal from the modulated resistance here simply causes periodic saturation or adjustable analog saturation of the iron core and causes a modulation in the amplitude of that pulse train, and that's what gets sent off in the antenna. So that's how he proposed to get amplitude modulation with extremely simple apparatus in an age that predates vacuum tubes. So uh, this was a pretty amazing thing. Of course, he was written up as the boy genius of the area. And everything works out well, except not for him, because he's run over by spooked horses in the aftermath of the great San Francisco earthquake, and he's killed. So uh, that's a problem. So the investors say, huh, we've lost boy genius. Ah, solution, get another boy genius. So they go over to Stanford and they say, Professor Ryan, uh, can you open up your warehouse of boy geniuses and pick one out for us? He said, sure, no problem. Here's this guy, Cyril Elwell, Here's a picture of him when he was no longer a boy, but still a genius. And Elwell was able to take uh, McCarty's equipment and he was able to make the very first mobile telephone call in history in 1908. It's documented by the San Francisco Call newspaper and he was able to get about a mile with his apparatus. So when Marty Cooper of Motorola goes around the world telling people he made the first phone call of mobile, nah, eh, not quite so fast, Marty. Uh, Elwell's got you beat by a good uh, 60 plus years. So the bad news was that it didn't look like it could scale. The quality of the sound was crappy, that's a technical term, and apparently it could never be made uncrappy enough to satisfy people, so uh, that was a problem. Now Elwell uh, had to give the bad news because he was now the guy in charge, and he said, I'm sorry, but McCarty really had already kind of taken this pretty much as far as it can be taken, and that's it, and it's not good enough, so we got a choice to make here. Either we just shut out, shut off the lights, go home, or I happen to know about this crazy Danish guy who's come up with another technology that we might be able to use. So here's Valdemar Poulsen, who actually had previously invented magnetic recording in 1900. Uh, he followed that up with the invention of the arc oscillator. This is not a technology that you should have studied anywhere in classes. If so, you've wasted your, your time. But it was an offshoot of illumination technology. It turned out if you take two pointy carbon rods, shove a big current through them so the points start to glow a little bit, then you withdraw the points just a little bit, you can maintain a glowing plasma. And for various reasons we won't go into right now, that has a negative resistance characteristic. That plasma has a negative region of the IV characteristic. So if you take a negative resistor and you stick it into a circuit that has an L and a C, you might be able to get an oscillation, and it gives you a sine wave. It's not a spark train. And so that was kind of cool, and Poulsen thought so too. Unfortunately, he was running up against Marconi's very powerful business forces where we turn in Europe. And so he was thwarted. He was unable to commercialize the invention. So just as he was about to give up, the good old uh, Elwell forces show up on his doorstep and say, we'd like to license your technology. He says, great, let's make a deal. So 
what happens is that mix of technologies and historical accidents turns into the founding of a company called Federal Telegraph. And this is the first time we see the archetypal mix of a Stanford component, boy genius, and some people with money but no brains who are willing to fund people with brains. And so you've got Stanford President David Starr Jordan, the founding president of Stanford, uh, civil engineering chair, uh, Beach Thompson who was a moneyed guy, and the Crocker family who had made their money in the gold rush and the silver Comstock um, uh, mode. Uh, so there's lots of money and they just wanted to make more and they saw wireless as a potential new gold rush and they threw money at the venture. Uh, they later hired this guy named Leonard Fuller who was very important to, to Federal because it turned out that Federal had increased the power of their transmitters in steps by simply increasing the dimensions of everything. So if they wanted twice the power, they just made everything twice as big. And they were able to go up to 30,000 watts with that very simple method. Then of course, Murphy has to show up and they sign a contract with the US Navy for a 60,000 watt transmitter. So they take the 30,000 watt transmitter, they double all the dimensions, and at the end of it, they have still a 30,000 watt transmitter. It's just heavier than the previous generation and they are somewhat disappointed. Uh, panicked, actually, is the word. So they hire Leonard Fuller and they say, you know, we have this problem. Uh, do you think you can solve it? He says, well, I don't know. Uh, tell me what you've done. And they explain, we take L and multiply it by two to get two L. And he said, that's a cute joke. No, really, how do you guys design this? And they say, no, really, that's how we design it. <laughs> he said, I think I can probably do better than that. <laughs> so he said, I'm gonna use science and math. Oh, that's good, that's good. Science, excellent. And yeah, yeah, give me some of that science. So he gives them science and he was able to go to 60 kilowatts and in fact he came up with scaling laws that allowed them to scale up to arbitrary powers limited only by how much money they were willing to pour into the materials list. And for this work he obtained MIT, uh, Stanford's first uh, double E PhD. He later became uh, the department chairman at, at Cal. Then he came to his senses and returned to Stanford and where he finished out his career. So there is the heart of Silicon Valley. I've given it the name Arc Alley because you've got to give it a name. So it's Arc Alley. And uh, this is now a parking lot with a little plaque that says this is the origins of Silicon Valley. One of three such plaques <laughs> in Silicon Valley. But this is the earliest birthplace of Silicon Valley. And here's a technology I won't say very much other than to note that it seems to contain no electronic components whatsoever. It just got this glowing arc. It's got these two magnetic pole pieces and it's filled with hydrogen gas because it's the lightest, lowest inertia gas that they could have. And the whole thing would oscillate at the awesome frequency of 200,000 cycles per second. Faster than you can count. That's fast. So back then 200 kilohertz was infinity. Today it's DC, it's one over F noise. But back then, this was the cutting edge, man. Let me tell you, you know, had stand back because you're gonna be blown away by the speed. So Federal has a distinction of being the first VC-funded electronics company in the Valley. It absorbs many employees of defunct companies elsewhere, including uh, Lita Forest Company, uh, who had started a uh, company in, in competition with, with uh, Marconi, got caught ripping off Marconi's patents, got crushed, killed, and destroyed by Marconi in the courts. So the Forest uh, employees go flocking to the nearest uh, geek haven, which is Federal, and DeForest himself hangs out at Federal uh, especially after barely escaping a conviction for fraud in New York. And it was while he was at Federal that DeForest discovered that his vacuum tube, which he had patented five years earlier, actually did something. This is where he discovered it amplified. Interesting that he would invent something without knowing what it's gonna do, and then five years later finds out what it does. It kind of shows you that DeForest actually was pretty clueless, and he was just lucky in this case because he was surrounded by clever people from Federal. Uh, in 1912, Federal beats out General Electric in a shootout for the, the prime contract with the U.S. Navy to build out their first global wireless communications network. And it was an amazing thing that this tiny company in this place in California that they figured, you know, gunfire would erupt spontaneously every Friday afternoon from saloons, uh, somehow beats out General Electric for this thing. A guy named Fred Terman interns there in the summer of 22 before heading off to MIT. A guy named Charlie Litton works there. Uh, he later hires a guy named Cecil Green, who founds a company called Texas Instruments. So lots of interesting things kind of converge back in history, uh, starting at uh, Federal. Now here's a picture of their 
penultimate transmitter. They actually had a one million watt transmitter under construction when World War I ended. Here's their last really shipping uh, transmitter, 500 kilowatts. And that's fuller on the left. Now understand that they delivered this in 1917. They didn't start building arc transmitters until 1909. So in eight years, they're going from a 50 watt prototype to 500 kilowatts. So Moore's law in the form of a generic exponential is not new. This, that's a pretty good scale up in less than a decade to go from 50 watts to 500,000 watts. That's pretty impressive. And by the way, simulation tools were pencil and paper and a slide rule uh, implemented uh, on a carbon wetware engine that needs food regularly, especially donuts. Now, of course, after you've built up a global communications network, that's not something that you repeat too many times too often. And so Federal, after World War I, kind of hit a rough patch. There really wasn't anywhere to go. There wasn't a consumer market for 500 kilowatt transmitters. So unfortunately, their, few, their fortunes were rather limited. Uh, so they get bought by a bunch of companies and ultimately end up at ITT uh, in 1928. ITT is interesting because it keeps recurring as the last stop for the carcasses of various Silicon Valley startups. This is just the first of several prominent ones. Uh, but there's a, there's a set of happy endings to the story. In 1931, Litton and Fuller are having lunch and they're reminiscing about the good old days. At this point, Fuller is at Cal and Fuller's talking about, gee, the depression's really bad. I got this young hotshot physicist and he needs lots of really expensive equipment. Like he's asking for crazy things like 50 ton magnets, like where the hell am I gonna get that under these budgetary conditions? And Litton says, hello, we have an 80 ton magnet that's been rusting in a warehouse in Menlo Park since 1918. That's right, so instead of paying for the storage, let's donate it to Cal, get a big tax write off, everyone's happy. So this guy happens to be Ernest Lawrence. He designs a gigantic cyclotron using this magnet and he wins the 1939 physics Nobel with it. So that's a happy thing. And more relevant to consumers, companies start to spin off of Federal as it decayed. A company called Magnavox, another company called Jensen, spin off of, uh, of Federal. So there's Ernest Lawrence on the right. From his grim face, I think that it's not quite working yet, but it was only a couple years later, it would, it would work fine. And you kind of recognize this uh, gigantic magnet structure around it. That's the Federal magnet. So Magnavox went on to build the world's first PA system, and here is where the first time it was used in San Diego Stadium when President Woodrow Wilson addressed 50,000 people uh, for the first time in history. Um, those of you who have ever done these demos at the last minute when your prototype is not really quite ready, but you still gotta go on, you know, the show's gotta go on. Uh, as Woodrow Wilson is climbing the ramp to take the podium, a smoky fire breaks out in the amplifier guts. And, you know, headlines are flashing through the engineer's heads. Oh my God, president destroyed by, <laughs> you know, faulty Silicon Valley equipment. Uh, engineers jailed for life. Um, so the chief engineer just reached in, grabbed the uh, vacuum tube nearest him in the output stage and pulled it out and hoped that that was the problem. Smoke cleared. Amplifier kept on working. Now that never happens to me. What always happens to me is I reach in, I get shocked nearly to death, and the thing blows up anyway. But for him, he was lucky. Uh, he must clearly live a, a cleaner life than I do. Now, back then, if you were a techno geek, this is what you lusted after. This is what other techno geeks would be jealous of if you owned this and they didn't. This was iPod Rev Zero. This is, you know, two magnificent ebony horn speakers with six, count them, six powerful vacuum tubes. Wow. Now that's cool. I, in fact, uh, I feel techno lust for this even today. I wish I had this thing just to power it up and, and listen to it screech, uh, two channels. Now beyond Federal, there was a lot of activity going on in Silicon Valley because Federal turned out to be a West Coast aggregator of geek, geekness. And so when Federal fell apart, there were other receivers of geekness that were just waiting in the wings. And one of these was the very first electronic television which most people think of as having been an invention of RCA, but we find out that's false because RCA wrote the uh, encyclopedia entries. And uh, so a 20-year-old kid named Phil Farnsworth sets up shop in San Francisco in 1926. He had invented electronic television at the age of 16. He had sketched out the diagram for electronically scanned TV uh, to his high school science teacher. And somehow he's able to convince businessmen to fund him his personality must have been pretty awesome to be able to pull that off, or these guys must have been really stupid. Uh, 
but one, you know, combination of the two works pretty well. They do give them advice like wear a vest and a tie and you'll look more professional. And if you can, grow a mustache so that you'll look older and people will take you more seriously. So here he attempts a mustache. His wife says, now you look like a goof. So he shaves it off later. Uh, he hires some Stanford grads and he works on, on electronic television and he succeeds. Uh, his first image is that of, I think it's his wife or possibly his brother-in-law, in 1927, <laughs> uh, this fuzzy image, and he perfects the entire system from transmission to reception uh, by 1934 and demonstrates the whole thing at the uh, newly opened Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, five years before RCA uh, talks about any kind of working system. Of course, RCA crush, kills, and destroys them. They were sort of the combination of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, plus every evil robber baron characteristic that you can possibly imagine times 10 to the large exponent. Uh, and so ITT eventually absorbs the assets of Farnsworth. Did he also have the work on fusion? Yes, he did, the, fusion, the uh, Farnsworth impactor. Uh, and people use bits of that technology actually in fusion, fusion research today. So he's pretty amazing. He was a self-taught you know, Mormon farm boy who had no formal education beyond the age of 16. Uh, when his family moved out of, uh, out of Utah. So uh, one of these you know, amazing stories that if you just written a fictional story you know, about a character with these characteristics, you say, yeah, you're kind of pushing the envelope there. No one's gonna, uh, that's not believable. But it was true. Now, a relevant part of a branch of the story in Silicon Valley involves vacuum tubes, about as far away from silicon as you get, can get. There's a high power microwave tube called the Klystron and it was invented by these two guys when they were a little bit older than the pictures shown here. Uh, Russell and Sigurd Varian uh, were an interesting pair of guys. They're very close as brothers all their lives. One of these was a just a mechanical genius, just loved to build things, just had a natural gift for modifying the physical aspect of atoms. And the other one was just a very gifted physicist, just a natural, his brain was just pre-wired to solve the equations of physics naturally. And uh, so they made a perfect pair. They lived about 100 miles south of Stanford. And so when they got into Stanford, they walked to Stanford from that home. It was the easiest way to get there. They liked hiking, so why not? So they walked to Stanford. So they must have really, really wanted to go to Stanford. So anytime I hear my students whine about something being difficult, I say, have you walked 100 miles? No, then shut up. <laughs> you got no right to complain. So. Arc Alley kind of morphs into Vacuum Tube Valley for a while, thanks to the Klystron success. It's used as the local oscillator in all Allied airborne radar receivers throughout World War II. It was a compact source of microwave energy, and so it was about the only thing you could actually put into an aircraft and not weigh it down too much. They found a company that gets started uh, at right after World War II. Um, they end up using the, the Klystron in a gargantuanly scaled up version to power up the three kilometer uh, linear accelerator that, that is slack. Uh, it's still there. It's fun to walk around. You can get tours and you can see gigantic klystrons, uh, each with you know umpteen kilowatts of power. That's a pretty amazing thing. It'll heat up your burrito in nanoseconds. It's a great, great device. And various other companies uh, get formed around the vacuum tube technology. They're just sort of a vacuum tube gestalt and meme in the valley. Now the part of the story that you probably have heard something about involves Fred Terman, a professor at Stanford, encouraging two of his star students, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, who were very close friends, to go start a company. Because Terman felt bad that every time his star students would graduate from Stanford, there were very few jobs locally, and they'd all have to head back east and work for GE or something. And he felt that was just wrong. He wanted a local um, sink for all the talent that Stanford was sourcing. And so he encouraged them to start this company. They first market a very wide range RC oscillator which turned out to be perfect for testing audio gear. And Walt Disney Studios found that this is the perfect thing because they were going to use stereophonic sound for the movie Fantasia, and they needed to test it. And all the other companies had things that were the size of a refrigerator, no kidding. And wheeling that thing around was not convenient and was sometimes dangerous. And so when these guys said, hey, we have a desktop oscillator, the desktop revolution happens. So they went from mainframes to desktop oscillators, and that was a huge deal. Gee, I've heard that theme before, but these guys had it first. Now, during World War II, Terman leaves Stanford. He's invited uh, to go to 
uh, Harvard and head up this place called the Radio Research Laboratory, a nice, innocuous, generic-sounding name that hit its true purpose. The RRL's top secret mission was to develop countermeasures to radar that was being developed down the road by MIT engineers at the Radiation Laboratory. And the MIT guys didn't really know that that was the purpose of the Harvard lab. They knew that they were doing something complementary, but they didn't know that they were out and out adversaries. The idea was, the assumption was, that whatever the radar guys would cook up, the Germans would eventually cook up, and so we ought to have a red team, a so-called you know, counter team, that's trying to defeat that so that we're ready when the time comes. And they succeeded brilliantly. One of the brilliant inventions they came up with is a thing called chaff. It was just strips of metal cut to a half wavelength, and they would dump these out of airplanes by the bucket load, and they would just give you sparkly reflections if you pinged them with radar, and you wouldn't be able to tell noise from signal. And it was so successful that when the Allies went to bomb Hamburg, the normal thing was you'd over-provision your, your airplanes and ordnance by about a factor of 5 to 1 to 10 to 1, assuming that you're going to lose a lot of your planes on the way. We lost almost none of them. And they dropped all their ordnance on target, and it created a horrific firestorm in Hamburg, the first one of these that uh, ever occurred. They didn't anticipate uh, creating such a thing. It was horrific. Uh, but it just showed that the chaff was, was spectacularly successful beyond all predictions of success. Nothing ever goes right in technology. This is one of the rare exceptions to that rule. Now, while all this is going on, and he's getting plenty of pats on the back for all of his accomplishments, he notices that something wasn't quite right. All the East Coast schools were getting all the, all the money, and the West Coast schools were being shut out. Just MIT, Harvard, Caltech, and Columbia together were receiving more than half of the total budget for electronics, defense work. They got $230 million, and this is $230 million 1940s dollars. That's serious coin. Stanford, he checked, was getting 50,000. <laughs> he didn't like the order of, he didn't like the number of tens of dB difference in that, so he needed to change the balance a little bit. So uh, he makes sure that he spends his time during the war schmoozing appropriately, getting to know people and getting people to know him. And so after the war, he decides, after being made the Dean of Engineering at Stanford, that Stanford was going to get in the game in a serious way and be essentially the DOD's uh, R&D arm for electronic countermeasures. So that was it. And he hires, in fact, 11 Harvard RRL alumni uh, to form a core faculty group that was going to make this happen. So they quickly uh, established dominance in the, an area called SIGINT and ELINT, the electronic intelligence or signals intelligence. And it turns out the Cold War was the perfect foil for his ambitions. It allowed a free flow of dollars from Washington directly to Stanford. There's still uh, retired faculty around who joke, but only half so, about you know bags of cash suddenly showing up in the parking lot, you know, <laughs> and who knows where this came from? But everyone kind of knew what it was going to be used for, and uh, it was quite extraordinary uh, how quickly the fortunes reversed, and, and Stanford started to get um, uh, quite a, a significant uh, piece of the pie. Uh, Terman decides to uh, amplify. The, the attractiveness for investment by encouraging established companies to set up defense-related uh, divisions in the Valley. He also encourages faculty and students, actively encourages them to go off and start companies and that they could have this nice free flow of information and business and, and personnel between industry and the university. And he's so successful that within 20 years, 35% of the electrical engineering department's budget is for classified research, including classified PhDs. I'm not exactly sure how the, def how the PhD defense works. You know, you ask a question, well, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but give me my degree. Okay, sign off. Very good. <laughs> Welcome to the, the group, doctor. Uh, goofy stuff, but that's, that's the way it was. So at this point, you're probably thinking, Silicon Valley, there's no mention of silicon so far. When does silicon show up? Well, it's, it's, as I say, it shows up kind of late. So if we back up just a little bit to just the threshold of World War II, this guy, Bill Shockley, has been hired by Bell Labs to start research in solid state electronics, which no one knew what that was going to be. But a brilliant guy named Mervyn Kelly at Bell Labs had projected that the maintenance of the Bell Labs mechanically based switching network was going to require more technicians than humans were going to produce within a century. And so he was thinking about the long game. He says, okay, mechanical things are just never going to get there. We need other technologies. And he had just read about quantum theory and solid state stuff and thought that there was possibly a path here because he knew the other ones were dead ends. So he hired the most 
promising young graduates in this area and said, I don't know what the solution is, but look in this space and see what happens. Here's a bunch of money. Go and make good things happen. Shockley started off with cuprous oxide. Failed. Someone says, oh, you dumb cluck. Of course you're going to fail with cuprous oxide. It's this messy compound. So I'm like, doctor, you want an element like germanium. He says, okay, great. I'll switch to germanium. That works just as poorly. And then World War II shows up and they get distracted. But finally, they succeed in 1947 with this. Now, I show my students this, and they go, well, that doesn't look like an A student project. <laughs> it's all kind of messy. I mean, this is really, you know, this bent stuff here. It looks like there's glue, and, you know, the only thing that's missing is duct tape, which is probably over here off the screen. Uh, but this got them the Nobel Prize, so don't giggle too hard. So it shows that you don't need to have fancy clean rooms to win a Nobel. You can do this with things that are you know, mounted with tweezers and glue, and there you have it. Uh, so a historic artifact. And there's the picture that uh, revealed to the world at large for the first time this invention of the transistor. Here's Shockley looking like a scientist while his two uh, underlings look adoringly on. No, not exactly. Um, this is actually Walter Bratton in his lab. That's his bench. Now, if you are an experimenter, when I say it's your bench, you know what I mean by this. This is your domain. This is your kingdom. That's your castle. Anybody else coming in is an interloper and is, is you know, you, the antibodies must reject this foreign thing. Uh, but the boss insists on touching this. Now, Shockley was a brilliant theorist, but he was equally maladroit at manipulating actual physical objects. So he probably just broke something that Bratton had worked for months to fine tune. And if you look very carefully, the muscles on his, <laughs> he's got a clenched jaw. And I've asked people about this and there's enough Anecdotal evidence that I, I believe is true, that many pictures were taken. And this was the only one that didn't show just out and out hatred uh, <laughs> in an obvious way in the photograph. So this is the closest they could get to a neutral shot. And they went with it on the cover of this magazine. Shockley uh, became known within Bell Labs as, again, a, a brilliant guy, but a totally useless manager. And they basically told him, you, you know, you're never going to rise above this level. And so he left. Now, why did he come to Stanford? The, again, the standard stories as well, you know, Fred Terman was such a fantastic salesman. He pointed to Stanford. He says, we'll give you some land. We'll give you some access to faculty. And that's all true. But the real reason he came to Palo Alto is that's where he grew up. And his mother still lived there in the house that he grew up in. And mom was getting kind of old, didn't have a place in Bell Labs anymore. So of course, he's going to go to see mom. Oh, we're going to where else, you know? Why not? So he sets up. Uh, Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory at a place that's now a wash and go um, cleaners uh, in Mountain View. And there's a plaque there that says, Here is the founding place of Silicon Valley. Uh, that's the third one. The second one is uh, the garage where Hewlett and Packard did their oscillator. So there are three places that are the birthplace of Silicon Valley. And uh, he is unable to hire Bell Labs people. Why? Because they know him. Um, but he's able to hire a bunch of other people who have only read his papers and have not met him. So people like Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore are attracted to, to uh, Shockley. And on November 1st, just a few months after founding the company, he finds out that he, Bardeen, and Bratton have won the uh, Nobel Prize in physics. And that's great. And Bardeen later wins another one for explaining superconductivity. So here's the, the boy genius in 1910 growing up in the shadow of Federal. Here's the boy genius grown up accepting the Nobel Prize. And here's his uh, group of new hires celebrating uh, at Dinah's Poolside Shack, which still exists in Silicon Valley, uh, celebrating actually a champagne breakfast. It's not a supper. And here they are toasting the old man. This is the last time that they're all smiling. There's Bob Noyce. There's Gordon Moore. And they're, by and large, fairly happy because they got free champagne and they're not having to work that day. So that's great. That was probably the last time that they all were feeling good because it turns out Shockley was a nut job, a grade A nut job. He liked to test people's creativity and IQ and psychological state and management potential just by giving them all sorts of puzzles, and he just rate people. And he um, thought that it would be a good motivator for harder work by posting everyone's salaries in real time on a bulletin board. So you could track whether or not you were doing well in the eyes of the boss. Yeah, that's a real motivator. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one day, a, a, a pin was sticking out of a door and cut 
uh, his secretary, and she bled a little bit, and he was convinced that somehow this was deliberate and threatened to bring in private investigators with polygraphs until someone pointed out, no, that just looks like a cheap push pin and the head broke off and left the note on the door and the note's gone. Oh, never mind. So he did kind of wacky stuff like this. The worst thing was his bad business sense. He hired all these guys to build a transistor and then he changed his mind. And he decided that what the world really needed was not a transistor, but a four layer diode, basically an SCR. Huh? How many SCRs do you use every day versus the number of transistors you use every day? So they all thought that he was completely loony, but could not convince him to change. So finally, in frustration, eight of the members just leave en masse on September 18th, 1957. The reason for the specificity of the date will become clear shortly, but just keep that in your mind. September, mid-September 1957, they form a company called Fairchild. And of course, Shockley's company hangs around for a while, never makes a dime, gets passed around, eventually ends up in the bowels of ITT. Uh, Shockley, of course, is now shamed into becoming a Stanford professor where he ends his career. <clears throat> so on October 4th, 1957, Fairchild's future is assured by the Soviet Union. They launch Sputnik. And Sputnik has no electronics other than a transmitter and a modulator that beeps. All it does is beep on 10 meters. So if you had a shortwave receiver turned to 30 megahertz, you'd hear this thing just go beep, 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 beep. And uh, Americans hearing this beep thought there was a message there. The message was, we will kill you. And so as this thing flew overhead, they heard, we will kill you, we will kill you, we will kill you. I am told from my experience at DARPA, I don't know if this is true, I have no documentary evidence, but there's lots of people who told me the story, so it's either true or just a good story, that the CIA spent fair amount of taxpayers' dollars trying to decode the beep. <laughs> Certain that there was some hidden telemetry information in the beep. And they spectrum analyzed the bejesus out of the beeps and they concluded, no, it's just beeps. <laughs> <laughs> a month later, the Russians outdo themselves by launching a living being. They launched Laika, the space dog. And as far as we can tell, Laika was taunting the United States and, and its canine inhabitants with uh, some trash talk here. Uh, I poop at you. And um, so 500 kilogram payload was a pretty serious payload. We couldn't even launch a grapefruit at that point. They're launching living things. That was frightening to the US. It was just one month after Fairchild gets started to make silicon transistors that would have wide temperature range. Ooh, that sounds useful. And here is the very first transistor that Fairchild made and sold. Uh, on the open market. This was a silicon transistor that had unheard of temperature specs, had fantastic FTs. It was an amazing thing that these guys pulled together. They went from opening the door to their facility to shipping their first lot of transistors to IBM. They got $150 per transistor. They shipped it on time. They almost didn't because they realized after they got all the transistors tested that they had no shipping department. They'd forgotten that part. And they went, oh, geez, no, if we don't make it today, though, we miss the date. And it's really important to meet that date, just a symbolic thing. So they send one of the guys out to the local grocery store. He comes back with a Brillo box. And they take out the Brillo pads, and they put the transistors in it. <laughs> and they <laughs> label it to IBM with love, Fairchild. And I'm sure the IBM people thought, yeah, California, yeah, of course. You know, what do you expect? But they shipped it on time, and the transistors work, and, and Fairchild established its dominance right away. Now, of course, this isn't a purely California story, although Californians like to tell it that way. This guy invents the IC while everyone else at TI is on vacation. That's a nice employee, isn't it? Because most people, when your boss is on vacation, you read magazines, you surf the web, you see cute cat videos on YouTube. Uh, and this is what he builds. Again, a Nobel Prize winning thing that looks like it was slapped together by a four-year-old child with neuromuscular disorders. And yet, this is the birth of the industry that we're all, you know, our, our mouths are fed by this. And so here's a glass microscope slide in which he's glued down a little strip of germanium. He's got one transistor, he's got one diode made out of the transistor. The diode is reverse bias as a capacitor. And when I ask students, what do you think the first IC was? Everyone says, I think it was a NAND gate. No, maybe it was a uh, flip-flop. No, it was an analog component, damn it. Uh, not a digital component. And when I tried to extract the most likely net list for this thing, I could actually not get enough phase shift to make it oscillate at 1.3 megahertz. I would get off by an order of magnitude or something. I had the 
pleasure of meeting Jack Kilby when a prize in his name was inaugurated at uh, ISSCC. And so I said, Mr. Kilby, you know, I'm curious. I tried to reverse engineer this, and I tried to guess, you know, based on historical documents about what sort of doping levels you guys had back in the late 1950s, and I can't get this unless I add in a 10-puff scope probe capacitance on the output. So could you explain to me? And uh, he changed the subject quickly. <laughs> so I think that he knew <laughs> that the scope probe was actually part of the integrated circuit, but that's okay. <laughs> He's not going to give back the the Nobel. Now the problem with, with Kilby's oscillator is that it was wired still with bond wire, so it didn't solve the integrated circuit problem completely. He could make the components, but he couldn't wire them together. That required this guy on the right, Jean Ernie, one of the unsung heroes of the Silicon Age, and Bob Noyce on the left, who figured out how to use Ernie's technology to actually also embed interconnect and but um boom you have the IC in the form pretty much as we know it today. And so there is artifact number zero from the very first year of Moore's Law. It's a single transistor, 1959. It's the 2N1613, the first planar transistor to go into production and be offered for sale in the open market. That led a couple years later into a four transistor mighty flip-flop with this unusual round shaped, you know, how do you scribe that? It's pretty much the entire wafer, exactly. And they just kind of ground down the edges to make it fit into a transistor case. And uh, this was etched by Gordon Moore, and uh, he told me that he's very embarrassed by this because he over-etched that contact. And he said that's the only photograph they had because they didn't take photographs of working ones, they took the photographs of the broken ones for FA, for failure analysis. And he says it really chaps him that this is now in the Smithsonian, you know, of of Gordon Moore's mistake, and I somehow don't think people hold this against Gordon Moore, <laughs> but he's, he's still sensitive to this day. Now, uh, many of my students ask about all these black dots here, because you don't see them in modern chips. If you do, then you shut down the fab and you clean it. These guys were all chain smokers. That's tobacco. That's <laughs> cigarette ash. <laughs> Their yields were terrible. Don't smoke in the fab, <laughs> but they didn't need that advice for years. So I, I just love it. You, just, you, know, you can probably work backwards, do some chemical analysis to figure out what brand of cigarettes they were smoking that day. Now, there was no consumer market to keep the IC business going during this time. They had not advanced to the point of complexity where they could really do things that you couldn't do with, with discretes. So you need somebody to subsidize you in those lean years when you're crossing the chasm, to use an overused term, from the birth to when you get to a level of scale where you're finally now able to outcompete uh, the other solutions. Luckily, the Cold War in the form of the space race arrived to solve the problem. Military and aerospace guys were responsible for essentially 95% of the income of Fairchild in those early days. There was no real consumer market for these things. They were just too, too high tech. And this is a famous box that you've probably never seen before. This is the Apollo guidance computer that the lunar module used to land on the moon. It contained 4,000 RTL, not TTL, this is resistor transistor logic. That's what the RTL stands for in this context. 4,000 of these three input NOR gates. You know how sometime in digital class 101 they'd say, well, in principle, you can build any von Neumann machine with an arbitrary number of NOR gates. This is a proof. <laughs> they use 4,000. That's an arbitrarily large number of, of NOR gates, absolutely. And, you know, nukes use them too. The Minuteman too is an example. And so TI, being the established big Kahuna, they got the first uh, PO for Project Apollo ICs. In 1961, they signed this PO, $1,000, 1961 dollars per gate. In 1961, you could buy three automobiles, three Volkswagen Bugs, for $1,000. So it was either three cars or a Norgate. <laughs> yes, thank you, Apollo program, otherwise we would never be able to have more Norgates. Fairchild wins the second PO a year later, but they deliver first because they had the planar process. TI didn't. They could not interconnect <laughs> even these four transistors or six transistors. And, and here it is. There's their uh, dual three input NOR gate. Here's how they were packaged in this thing called a flat pack, which you don't see anymore, but that's what they had. And it was eventually offered for sale in the open market as the MicroLogic 915 uh, dual three input NOR. And there it is. There's an image of the first PO in Silicon Valley 
for an IC. And they were selling them for $43.50 each, a bargain, 1 20th the cost that TI was quoting. And these worked. <laughs> That's pretty good. So again, Fairchild uh, delivers on time and under budget, and yeehaw, Silicon Valley. Uh, pretty amazing. Now, I wish today I could get $43.50 for a three input NOR gate. Uh, that'd be a lot nicer. Now, today, you build a quad core, wooga wooga mega thing, and they give you a nickel and say, you know, when can you give it to me for four cents? You know, show me that, that path. Now, Fairchild was doing very well technologically, but unfortunately, they were part of an East Coast company. And the East Coast company was taking all the profits generated by the wildly successful West Coast operation and using it to fund stupid, lossy things on the East Coast. And finally, they get fed up on the West Coast. And so a couple of guys, Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce, leave yet again to found another company. They don't know what they're going to call it. Initially, they call it More Noyce. And then they said that out loud a few times, more noise, more noise. Oh, that's not good for a company in electronics. So, so they changed the name to Intel for Integrated Electronics, which seems to be a much better name. And they were bet early on on silicon uh, gate MOS technology, and that seems to have been a, a pretty good choice for them. It seems to have worked out well, reportedly. Um, they invent the DRAM, essentially. It, it kills off discrete uh, solutions for memory chips. They build the first microprocessor that's recognized to be a microprocessor uh, in 1971. It had 2,000 transistors, which is an astounding uh, affirmation of Moore's law in its early form, built in 10 micron technology laid out by hand on a thing called Rubylith, which was this gigantic mylar pink reddish transparent thing. And you take an exacto knife and you'd carve out the lithographic patterns. And if, you, if your hair fell out on the thing, it would short wires together, so you had to do this little surge with a magnifying glass to make sure no hairs fell on it. And you had to make sure that the previous guy who used his micro, microscope didn't have hairs fall on it. And so it was just never ending, and they, it was always trouble. But there it is. There's the 4004. And I believe this is the last chip that has the initials of the engineer on it, FF for Federico Fagin, who's still very much with us. Uh, Federico tells me that this caused a firestorm of upset at Intel because it was supposed to be you do the work for the company, not for personal glory. And so ever since then, there's been this important rule at Intel. You put your initials on it, you get fired. But that will happen after <laughs> this one. So FF is immortalized on every photograph of the 4004. Now, if you take a look at what's going on here with the defense activities going on, and you've got silicon slowly coming up the ramp, and just sort of to give us a level set, just a scale calibration, uh, just take a look at the green bars and the blue bars. The green bars are the defense dollars going into Silicon Valley up to 1972 from 1953. You see the green bars are kind of following that trajectory. This is the venture capital money in blue. You can barely see that at all. So up to the 1970s, it's all defense R&D. There's no consumer market. There's no venture capital, private equity going into this thing. It's all defense dollars that are keeping the valley going. So that's what sustained Silicon Valley from World War II on up to the 70s. So for several decades, it's all defense money. It's all CIA, NSA stuff going on. It's something that they don't talk about very much. And things finally change because Silicon's advancing to the point where it's offering capabilities you couldn't get in other places, and it's now creating the possibility for compelling consumer applications. And this guy here, David Morgenthaler, is a fellow whose name should be much better known because he, almost more than some of the technology guys, is responsible for Silicon Valley being what it is. He decides that the only way to really kick off a revolution is just to have money flow in the thing. You need money as a lubricant. You need money as the gasoline. And what's preventing private equity? Part of it is that the laws are written in a way that, re that basically repels money from being invested here. One of these things has to do with the way retirement funds, municipal retirement funds, they're not allowed to invest in risky things in the 1970s. And, and Silicon Valley startups are considered very risky. So Morgan Thaler flies to Washington, DC, lives there for a year, camps out basically in the hallways of Congress, and convinces them they should rewrite the laws to encourage investment in speculative but high-tech ventures with a, a potential large payoff. And he wins after a year. And he gets a law uh, passed, so-called ERISA, that's the Employee Retirement Investment Securities Act, which then allows 
uh, pension funds to put lots of dollars into Silicon Valley. We're almost there. And he also gets the capital gains tax reduced to 28%. Boring stuff, but all of a sudden, things change because now money just starts getting dumped in heaps in Silicon Valley. It's unbelievable. And so the confluence of the dollars and the relentless onslaught of Moore's Law finally takes us to the consumer age, which is what we're living off of right now. The DOD is totally irrelevant to the story now. Uh, that This is all a result of the technology trends intersecting the financial trends doing the right things. So the question now is, we're reaching the end of what we think we can scale lithographically. At some point, we're going to have one atom between the, silicon, the source and the drain, and sometime before then, things are going to fall, uh, fall apart. So what might happen next? And will it necessarily happen in, in Silicon Valley? And the answer is no, it doesn't have to happen in Silicon Valley. But there's definitely more room uh, to grow. There's definitely exponential still waiting to be exploited and kicked off by people in this room. Uh, the brain is a pretty remarkable thing. Uh, the brain is 20 or 25 watts. Yeah, some people less than that, but on average, 20, 25 watts. And it does the amazing things that the brain does with one millisecond switching speed elements. We're building transistors with picosecond switching speed elements, nine orders of magnitude faster, and yet there's nothing that we can do with silicon that remotely approaches what we can do with a brain on 20 watts. So clearly the brain is doing some very interesting things that we still haven't quite sussed out, and once we suss it out, we can use these nine order of magnitude faster transistors perhaps to do things that the brain can't do. So that's kind of exciting. And I think that now that we're sort of reaching the end of one road and we're going to be incentivized to find another road because none of us want to be unemployed, that the vast quantity of brain power just thinking about this and having an economic incentive and self-preservation uh, imperatives, that will combine to put us on another track that's going to take us to the future that will finally allow us to contradict this statement by Werner von Braun that man is the only computer that can be mass produced by unskilled labor. <laughs> and so that is the challenge for the next generation to tell this guy to take a hike that he was wrong, that we can do better than that. So thank you very much. All right, I think we have time for a, a few questions. Mention about the uh, job advertisements that were in code. Oh, <laughs> what were those like? Okay, so the question was about the job advertisements that Shockley put into magazines uh, that were written in code. So Shockley wanted people who were curious enough to solve a simple substitution cipher. So in some magazines, some trade mags, basically if you saw this jumbled letter thing and you were smart enough to and incentivized enough to go solve it, it basically said, if you want a job with me, Shockley, call the following number. And so he attracted a few people that way. So he liked people who just liked puzzle solving. And that's how he, he found them. That was pretty clever. Actually, Shockley, for all of his faults, one of them was not uh, a lack of ability to find talent. He found amazingly talented people. He found, well, he found more. He found noise. Uh, he just was a brilliant, brilliant detector of hot minds. He just didn't know how to turn that inward <laughs> to himself and figure out where his deficiencies were and repair them. The guy was a total nut job. Um, at Stanford, we, we had a dedication to one of our older faculty, a guy named John Linville, who was a much beloved character. He, he started the semiconductor research program at Stanford. And at his dedication, you know, we asked him, so John, as you look over your career, what were the highlights? He says, oh, you know, we hired this brilliant guy named Jerry Pearson from Bell Labs. Not only was he a fantastic researcher, but he was a wonderful human being, a wonderful mentor to students and faculty. It's like a three-in-one kind of guy. And I said, well, what about on the other side of the spectrum? It's Shockley. <laughs> <laughs> he says, my, my colleagues have still not forgiven me. <laughs> so, there More you questions? Have. Anything? Uh, so is this just a hobby, sort of this history, or you know, are you planning to write this up? And how do you get all these images, and where does all this stuff come from? Okay, well, so this is kind of a hobby. Uh, I, so the question was, you know, was this the result of a hobby? And yes, it's largely a result of a hobby and a form of OCD, I guess. Um, but it's the result of students asking questions like, well, you know, who thought of this? Where did this come from? Or what came from, you know, what came before this? Or was this the only thing that they thought of? And so that question recurred with sufficient frequency that I decided to sit down and try to answer it. And each nugget that I uncovered would lead to another vein of other information until finally I got tired of it. So this is the result of uh, you know, stopping when I got tired. <laughs>
But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that is yet to be uh, uncovered. Uh, I just don't have the time. I have to do other things like write papers and stuff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but as far as my garage, yes, it's a scary place. What's the list called? It, it's essentially a super fun cleanup site in the making. <laughs> I have um, somewhere between 100 and 200 oscilloscopes, somewhere around 5,000 vacuum tubes. I have several kilograms of transistors that predate 1960. Um, I have the world's first transistorized oscilloscope given to me by the guy who built it by hand. Uh, it was featured on the cover of Electrical Design News, EDN Magazine in 1957. It had uh, 14 transistors that uh, if you could detect by feel they were above room temperature, it was too late. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a treasured heirloom. So I have stuff like that, basically a big box of crap. But I'm yes. a geek. Question in the back. Oh, yeah, so the question is, what was the significance of September 18th, 1957? It's because it's two weeks before Sputnik gets launched. So you've got these startup guys who just have this idea to make a transistor. There's no real market. They just hope that if they build it, somebody's going to use it. And two weeks later, the Soviet Union threatens us with nuclear annihilation. Uh, as that's how we interpret the beeping. And so that immediately created overnight a panic-stricken drive to develop advanced electronics for the military and aerospace applications. So the Soviets gave Silicon Valley <laughs> exactly what they needed uh, to juice things up. That was the dumb luck. That was the dumb luck. Yep. That's right. That was the component. Yes? Do you think there's a lot of, uh, like, what was going on in the Soviet Union at the same time? Was there a similar kind of research that we never hear about? Um, the Soviets never really developed much of a semiconductor infrastructure. In fact, that became painfully aware in the 1970s when a Soviet uh, Air Force pilot defected and he flew a MiG-25 into Japan. And the U.S., of course, was all over that thing like you can't imagine. And they were shocked that the only ICs they could find in it were made by Texas Instruments. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the critical avionics was actually done with vacuum tubes, which if you're a glasses half full person, you say, well, that's rad hard. If your glass is half empty guy, you say, wow, these guys are so pathetic, they didn't have transistors that were good enough to replace vacuum tubes. Uh, either way, they didn't have much of a semiconductor presence. They really never quite got it. They got most of their ICs from the West through third parties, which made TI very unhappy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, one more. Okay, why don't we oh, go ahead, Josh? So, so earlier today, you, you mentioned something about efforts to create Silicon Valleys in other places in the world. So has that ever succeeded to any extent? And if so, you know, how? Well, I'll defer to a report by uh, an author of a paper in Technology Review Magazine, the MIT publication. And they took a look at this question, I think within the last 18 months. And they claim that the failure rate of trying to replicate Silicon Valley in a box is 100.0%, four significant digits of failure. Um, and I think part of the reason can be found in just looking at this history. There's 100 years of randomness here and multiple phases of, of birth, uh, evolution and destruction and rebirth. And um, you know, how do you recreate 100 years worth of random history instantly? And you can compress it to a certain degree. I'm not sure you can compress it by a factor of 40 dB. And I think that the expectations that some muni municipalities have is you take People with money combined with a world-class university kind of stir the pot and instant Silicon Valley clone emerges. But uh, I think that those might be necessary ingredients, but I don't think they're sufficient. And the history here, we just look at how much luck was involved. If the Soviets hadn't launched Sputnik at that time, who knows if Fairchild would have gone on to, to glory. Um, if the Cold War hadn't taken the form it had, you know, maybe Sil Silicon wouldn't have been that important. Maybe Stanford wouldn't have been that important. Maybe it wouldn't have happened in, in Silicon Valley area. I mean, there's lots of, if Shockley hadn't been raised in Palo Alto, would, you know, would he have started that, that company there? I mean, there's all sorts of things that really were factors not under the simple control of external forces. A lot of rolling of the dice involved. All right, well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.